Well, we've been in a series called Divine Protection, and I uh, thought I'd be wrapping that up last week. And, you know, I just uh, felt impressed, uh, looked at, I, I just think we're going to, tonight we're going to go over a little bit, uh, just read some scriptures that we've read, but then also just go through just some examples of um, divine protection in the Bible, and specifically with angels. This isn't a you know, exhaustive study on, on that in any way. But, you know, we've been talking, actually, I've referenced certain things that happen in the Bible, and so we're just going to actually look at some of those scriptures, and just because some people may not be familiar, th- that these things are real. This, this is a realm that, that's, a, that's a existing all around us. I mean, we see the natural realm with our eyes, but the realm of the supernatural is real, more real than what we see. And when we're talking about divine protection, um, just looking at some of the examples in the Bible where you see uh, angels, because angels are the agents of God that are going to um, execute these things a lot of times. They're the ones that are actually making the protection happen. They're the ones that are putting their hand, you know, to, to block something from you. They're the ones that are giving you a nudge to get you out of the way. Uh, they're the ones that stand guard over you uh, all the time as we put our faith in God's Word and declare His Word. So, um, like I said, not necessarily just focusing on that, but just wanted to, to go through and and look at some of these things, I, I think it would benefit us. So let's look at Psalm 32, verse 7. Psalm 32, verse 7 says, You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. You are my hiding place. We read this scripture. It's kind of been one of the, the launching off places. You shall preserve me from trouble. In 2 Samuel twenty two thirty two, read this as, as well for you. Who is God except the Lord, and who is a rock except our God? God is my strength and power, and He makes my way perfect. In the ERV, it says, God is my strong fortress. He clears the path I need to take. In the GNT, it says, this God is my strong refuge. He makes my pathway safe. And we read those scriptures and have have spent some time there. Let's look at Psalm 91 as we go through. I'm just going to read through Psalm 91. You know, we've spent a lot of time talking about different parts of it. But uh, let's look at that and just um, some of the different aspects that it says, just to get that fresh in our mind. Psalm 91, verse 1, it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You know, as I go through this, and we've mentioned it before, but just mentioning it here, this is a great psalm just to go over. It, it, it just encapsulates all the protection of God. It's a great psalm just to read frequently, if not every day. Read it consider, concerning your loved ones. Reading it concerning yourself. That Remind yourself of this is what God is doing, This that you're putting your faith in Him and putting your faith in what He says here, um, not in just what we see naturally. Um, verse 5 says, "'You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness.'" nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Verse 8, only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. Notice that there. It says you have made the most high your dwelling place, the most high, the almighty. You know, we sang about it. Uh, tonight. There, there is nothing that can take out God. And when you make Him your refuge, you're saying that Almighty, that God, you're making Him your refuge. Well, there is nothing that can penetrate His protection. And so it says then, if you make the most high your dwelling place, verse 10, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for He shall give His angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Now, before we go on, let's go back. I want to read, you know, verse 11. Let's go back before we go on so we don't have to flip back to there. 
For he shall keep his an- or give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. You read that in some other versions. It talks about giving the angels directions, essentially. Giving the angels directions concerning us. That that's what he's doing. And daily, that God is actually giving the angels direction, direction and commands concerning our well-being. Um, in the Amplified Classic, we don't have that, but I, you know, it says that he will give his angels, um, that they, they shall uh, company defend and preserve you in all of your ways it says in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash head upon the lion and the cobra the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot because he has set his love upon me therefore i will deliver him i will set him on high because he has known my name verse 15 he shall call upon me and i will answer him i will be with him in trouble we talked about that last week. Just because we know God doesn't mean we're, there's never going to be in trouble. It just means that God is going to deliver us out of every trouble. We face challenges in this earth. We live in a fallen world, but we have a God that is greater than any challenge. And so as the challenges come, we don't fold and say, I have, I've got a challenge. Therefore, God has deserted me. Therefore, I don't know what to do. We press in and say, God's greater. God's bigger. I will go through. I will go over. God God says, I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. He said, I will, I will, uh, I will satisfy him with long life. So we can believe for a long life. We can believe that we are going to live until we're good and satisfied. In other words, you can't be taken out early. You've, this is what that said. It's, you're going to be satisfied. God said he would satisfy you with long life. So look after him. Go after him. Put him first and, and foremost in your life. Follow him. Like we've talked about, you be where he's told you to be. You do what he's told you to be. D- told where, he, where he's told you to be, that's where you are. You don't mess around. You're not playing games. You're not saying, well, I'm just going to go and float through. No, this world will kill you. It's not a place that you just do whatever you want to do as a Christian, and especially in in the day and age we live in. We're getting close. We're getting close to the end. We need to know God. We need to follow Him. We need to be where He's told us to be. But as you do that, then He will deliver He'll honor you. With long life, He will satisfy us and show Him our salvation. So we know, nope, not time for me to go. That's not going to take me out. Nope, that's not going to take me out. Nope, I'm not going under. I'm, I'm staying until I'm, I'm ready to go. Yeah. And I'm not leaving early until Jesus splits the clouds or, uh, you know, I live out my life fully. I'm not going. 2 Samuel 22, verse 1 says, Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength and whom I trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior. You save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. David is saying, I trust God and he surrounds me. He protects me. He's my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my stronghold. He's my salvation. And he saves me from everything that would try to take me out. Psalm 103, 20 says, bless the Lord, you his angels who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. So it says the angels, they, they excel in strength. They do his word, heeding the voice of his word. We, we read in Psalms where they, he gives, God gives them commands. Well, this is talking about the angels heed the voice of God. They heed his word, whether it's God commanding them or whether it's out of your mouth, the word of God, the angels are, go- are there to make sure what God has said comes to pass. So if we take up the word of God and we agree with God and we say, we're going forward, we're going on, we're protected, the angels are there to make that happen, to assure that what God has said will occur. And so we're going to go through, if you have your Bibles, 
uh, you know, you can look, just follow along with us, because we're going to do a good amount of reading, you know, just go through uh, some of these accounts, um, several accounts in the Old Testament, the New Testament, just read them. So just spend some time just looking at a few examples <laughs> of when, this is real, this isn't fiction, okay? But it reads like fiction. I mean, some people would say, oh, that's just a story. No, this is real. And what we need to do as we're reading these things is realize this is for us now. This isn't, this isn't something that we're reading so we can just say, well, that was great. That happened then. But that just doesn't have anything to do with us. We read it and say, those angels, that power is on the earth now. And it's for us now. So when we, it may look different in 2024, but the same power, the same God, the same angelic host, the same spiritual realm exists. And so we need to bring this in to our world and see it and see that happening. Let's look at the first one. Uh, 2 Kings 19, verse 14. Now, for the sake of time, I'd go back. You can go and read this whole uh, chapter and these whole accounts. They're really good, and they have a lot of detail. But for the sake of time, since I'm, I'm covering a lot of these, I, I'm, I'm going to cut some of this down. And so the background here is the king of Assyria, uh, Sennacherib, he is, uh, ba- he is threatening uh, the, the, the Israel threatening them, coming, and he's making a mockery. He's coming. He, they have mowed down other nations, and they are saying, um, they're going to the people that uh, are higher up in, in the nation, and they're mocking them, and then they're talking to them in Hebrew, and the people say, well, just talk to us. You know, in the common tongue, don't speak to us in Hebrew because the other people are going to hear you. And they say, we want everybody to hear them. And basically what they're saying is, don't you listen to Hezekiah. Hezekiah is leading you. He, he is telling fool, and that is not going to happen. The king of Assyria is going to take you out just like he's taken everybody out. And you need to know that your ruler is leading you in the wrong way. And they are just trying to instill complete fear in, in the people and so Hezekiah goes, and um, he, he is just, they've just done this again. And so we're going to pick up in verse 14, 2 Kings 19, verse 14. Verse 14 says, And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers. So it was an act, then they, they actually brought a letter as well and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear it. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, The kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the works of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God, I pray, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. So this huge army, this, you know, a uh, monster of a, of a nation is just taking nations out. There is no hope in the natural for the people pushed up against a wall. And, and Hezekiah, is the, the king, is just laying out and saying, God, show yourself strong. You've seen this person. He's mocking you. And show yourself strong so people know that you're God. And so the next verse, verse 20 says, Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, Uh, Amos sent to Hezekiah and said, thus says the Lord, now we're just going to read a portion of this, thus says the Lord, God of Israel, because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. So this is, we're just going to read the beginning of it, then pick up at the end because it's long. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you, laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind your back. 
Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high? Against the Holy One of Israel. And then he goes on and speaks a bunch of things against Sennacherib. And then verse 32, they, he's talking about the king of Assyria here. He shall not come into this city. So this is Isaiah the prophet prophesying about what's going to happen before it happens. He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor build a siege mount against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and he shall not come into this city, says the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Verse 35, and it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. One angel just took them out. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home and remained at Nineveh. Notice it's Nineveh, the evil area. Now it came to pass, as he was worshiping in the temple of Nisroch, his god, that his sons, Adramalek and Sherezer, struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. Then Esarhaddon, his son, reigned in his place, so his own sons killed him. So it looked like impossible that there is no way the people of God are going to be saved. Yet he, God turned it like that. The, the, the angel of the Lord took them out, and they went back the way they came, and nothing happened. It doesn't matter what it looks like in the natural. God's forces are much, much stronger. Now, we're going to read 2 Kings uh, verse six, or chapter 6, verse 8. This is actually earlier in 2 Kings, but I wanted to put it in this order. You see um, another scenario. Now, the king of Syria, different king of Syria, was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants saying, my camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel saying, beware that you do not pass this place for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to, to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him and was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, none my lord. In other words, the king of Syria, they, the, the, the Israelites keep going where the king of Syria is going to be. And so the king of Syria is saying, Which one of you guys is a traitor? You're, you're ratting us out. You're telling the, the Israelites where we're going to go. And so, verse 12, what, and one of, my serv, one of his servants said, None, my lord. So none of us are traitors, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. In other words, the prophet knows what you're saying in secret. Verse 13, so he said, Go and see where he is that I may send and get him. So let's go get Elisha. He goes, well, okay, that's fine. It's one guy. We're going to take him out. That's what he's saying. And it was told him, saying, Surely he is in Dothan. Verse 14, Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. So they're going after Elisha, one guy. They're going and they're going, Okay, so this dude's the, this is him, our problem? No problem. We're taking him out. They're sending an army after him. Verse 15, And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So Elisha, his servants there, they're, they're staying in this place. The, the king of Assyria, his army has surrounded Elisha and his servant. His servant goes out, sees all these people. And he goes back to Elisha and says, uh, what are we going to do? In other words, we are literally surrounded Verse 16, so he answered and said, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, you guys, this is not a story. This is an account of something that actually happened and nothing has changed in 2024 as far as the reality of this. Angels didn't just, they're just not in the Old Testament, not just in the New Testament, in the old times that this is going on. These angels are still on the earth. So make this real when you're reading it, make it applicable to now. 
So he says, don't fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha, verse 17, Elisha prayed, said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see his servant. Then the, the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. In other words, he saw in the spirit realm and he saw the reality of the situation. There's people that they can see in the natural and then there's the spiritual host that are there as well that cannot be seen normally with the, with the physical eye, but they're there and they're real and they're much more powerful. Verse 18, so when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the work of Elisha. So now all the people are blind. This one guy that they sent out an army after, they are powerless. They can't do anything because he, he speaks for God. And so no army can take him out. He has an army backing him up, a spiritual army. So uh, verse 19 then, it says, Now Elisha said to them, this is, so he tells the guys, and now he's just kind of mocking him. This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. So they are struck with blindness, and then he tells them, the guy you're seeking is not here, but I'll show you where he is. You think God doesn't have a sense of humor? God will not be mocked. We need to know that. 2024, God will not be mocked. People that think they're mocking him, God will have the last laugh. Don't, don't, don't get upset on God's behalf. He stands up for things, but don't go like, oh no, you know, they're doing... Just walk in the things of God. Stand up for truth. The evil will never win. God is not, his eyes are not closed. He said, but he led them to Samaria. So it was when they had come to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw, and they were there inside Samaria. Now, when the king of Israel saw them, he said, Elisha, my father, shall I kill him? So he led them back to the king of Israel. So in other words, they're surrounded. Shall I kill him? He said, but he answered, no, you should not kill him. Will you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? Set water and food before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So be nice to them, keep them alive, and then they'll go back home. Then he prepared a great feast for them. And after they ate and drank, he sent them away and, and they went to their master. And I love this. So the bands of the Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. Dealt with that problem. Of course, there was other problems later. The Sennacherib was later. It's not that the devil's going to stop, but the devil can't win if we stand up against him. Now, I'm giving you this detail. I'm just reading what, you know, like I said, we're not reading everything, but we're reading some of these because you see what actually happened. They came after one guy, and the guy made a fool of him because he served God. And God dealt with the problem. And that's the way problems can be in our life. They look like they're insurmountable, but God can go, and, and they never came back and, you know, messed with them again. This, it's, this is supernatural. You could make a really, this would be a really cool scene in a, a, a movie. Yeah. You imagine what you could do now with the technology? I mean, you could make that, and it, it would, that would be awesome. Acts 5, verse 17. So go into the New Testament. Acts 5, 17. <clears throat> so there's signs and wonders going on with the early church. They're doing uh, wonders. They're shaking the religious world up. Verse 17, then the high priest rose up. So the religious people got mad. And all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. And laid their hands on the apostles and put them in, in the common prison. So they put them in prison. Verse 19, but at, the, at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the word, words of this life. So they were put in prison and the angel came and just let them out. Now notice next verse, and when they had heard that, they entered in the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and, uh, high priest and those 
with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. So the guys put him in prison. The angel came, got him out of prison and said, go preach. So they go preach. Then the guys that have put him in prison are ready to go and harass him now. So they go send for him in prison. Verse 22, but when the officers came and did not find them in prison, they returned and reported saying, indeed, we found the prison door or the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. So not only did they get out of prison, the guards evidently didn't even know they were gone. So they supernaturally got them out of the prison. The angels got them out of prison and these guys went and preached and they, here the guards are outside watching. The doors are shut. Nobody inside. That's not fiction. That happened. God can do things that, that we can't do naturally. He got them, out the, got them out of there supernaturally. And this is available, if need be, to us now. This isn't something that we only see in, you know, some made-up movie. This is real. The Bible is actually really interesting and really good and has a lot of stuff just from, just from a story perspective. There are so many things in it that are really intriguing, and it's better than fiction because it's real. I mean, you know, it's one thing if you make this stuff up. It's another thing to realize the angels are in this room right now. Just think about that. Literally, we're not the only people in here. I mean, only beings. People. Angels are not people. They're created beings. But they're in here. A lot bigger than I am. You know, this foot's, or this, this ceiling, almost eight foot. It's a low ceiling. They're at least that tall, probably eight, nine, ten feet. Big guys. Strong, obviously. took out 185,000 people. Verse 24, and when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them saying, look, the men that you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Say, look, <laughs> they're, 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 now what would that, seriously, what does that do to their heads? I mean, they, they thought, they took out Jesus. He rose from the dead. Now they got people. They take them. They're going to put them in prison. And then, boom. They show up preaching. What does that do? Seriously. Do you, I mean, you think about it from their perspective. Well, God's not going to be, he's not going to, he's not going to lose. He's not going to be put under. He's going to win. Acts 12, verse 1. So it says, now about the time, that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now notice, this is the early church. They're just learning. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Evidently took him off guard. Because you look at what happened. Verse 3, and because... He saw that it pleased the Jews. He proceeded further to, see, to seize Peter also. In other words, he's going to kill Peter. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Verse 5, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now, behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him. Angels are not limited by prison doors or anything physical. He showed up, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his, his hands, and then... Then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. So he did. 
And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him, and he did not know that what was done by the angel was real, for he thought he was seeing a vision. So Peter's thinking, I'm dreaming. This is a dream. He doesn't real. This is what's really happening. Verse 10, when they were past the first and second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. So they're walking. Gate just opens up. Gates don't just open up by themselves. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. So the angel came, got him out, got him up, told him what to do, got him out of the, the prison, walks down the street, and all of a sudden the angel's gone. But Peter's out of prison. Verse 11, and then when Peter had come to himself, so he's like fully awake, and he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So this is the middle of the night, evidently, and they're there praying. See, now... Earlier, James was killed. Peter was seized, and now they're praying. They're interceding. So in the middle of the night, there's people praying for Peter. So they weren't taken off guard the second time. They did something about it. So verse 12, so when he had considered this, he, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Verse 13, and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she, saw, when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. So she goes out, recognizes Peter, doesn't open it, runs back in and says, Peter's at the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so, and they said, it is this angel. Verse 16, now Peter continued knocking. <laughs> so Peter's out there just knocking in the middle of the night. He heard somebody. They, they went away. What, what, what happened to the girl? I thought I was going to get in. Now, when he now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Verse 18, then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. So again, they don't know what happened. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. So they didn't know what happened. This just happened out from under the noses. The angel was able to deliver Peter in the middle of prison. God is able to get us out of anywhere. anywhere. It doesn't matter if it's a 2024 prison. I guess if angels can walk through walls and get people out, I mean, like that, he can do the same thing. Doesn't matter what kind of lock it is, man, magnetic or whatever, it could just open by itself. I suppose they can disrupt electronics and everything, no problem. And then finally, Acts 27, 21. It won't take time. So what's going on here is Apostle Paul is on a ship. Uh, they're sailing. They're, they're running into storms. Um, the, the commander of the ship is not listening to Paul. He's, Paul perceived that there was going to be danger, but they didn't listen to him. So they're in all kinds of turmoil on the ship. And, uh, you know, to the place where they're... they're in very bad place, but I want you to notice, um, and eventually the, the ship was lost, but they, they were saved. But in the middle of this, Acts 27, 21, it says, but after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, men, you should have listened to me. So he had told them, you, you don't need to keep going. It's going to cause trouble, but they didn't listen to him. And, and you should not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. 
For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve. I love that line. Saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. So in the middle of this, even though Paul was with people that didn't believe God, God spared them because of Paul. Because Paul was listening to God, and Paul was on a mission, and he had to be brought to Caesar. But he told him he was going to stand before kings. This was part of his commission, and it was not going to be thwarted, storm or no storm, but because of the mercy of God, everybody that was with Paul was spared. But, but the angel stood before Paul and said, there will be no loss of life. There's going to be the ship's going to go down. You're not going to be able to save the ship, but you're going to be okay because you must stand before Caesar. Middle of what looked like, again, hopeless situation, God was there and he sent an angel to do what needed to be done in the middle of a storm, in the middle of the sea, whether it's in a, in a prison, whether it's in the middle of you know, a siege, whether it's in the middle of, you know, somewhere where they're trying to take out a prophet, God can get the job done in any situation. Doesn't matter if it's a natural disaster like a storm. Doesn't matter if it's a army. God's power is greater. Always. So there is no situation where God's protection will fall short. If we'll trust him, if we'll be on the path we're supposed to be, notice Elisha, he was told him to do. An army couldn't stop him. Paul was doing what God told him to do. A massive storm could not stop him. God will deliver us out of trouble, out of anything. With long life, he will satisfy us, show us his salvation as we do what he's told us to do. You can go ahead and play. Amen. And that's for us. And that you know, if we just sat here and, or, or, you know, you sat there, listen, and you just took it like, like oh, that, those, those are some really, those are some good stories. Yes. Amen. And went right out. And then we're asking God, God, I just don't know what I'm going to do about such and such. We've missed the whole point. Because these account, the reason we have it written down is so we can take it and apply it to our lives. If we, if we look at these situations and say, wow, that was a huge army, but God delivered, and wow, that was a storm, and wow, that was prison, and then we turn right to our life and go, Lord, how am I going to do such and such? We're not applying the word into our own life, and we're making whatever we face bigger than all these things. I mean, I don't think it gets much worse than you being coming out of your house and see a huge army surrounding and they're after you. They're not after you and your army. They're after you. They have you surrounded. How do you get out of that without the supernatural help of God? But Elisha didn't even, she knew God. And the guy that was with him that was scared, he said, God, let's open his eyes and, and show him the reality. He didn't even ask for himself. I don't know if he saw or not. A situation like that, God can, can deliver. A situation where you're in prison, in bad prisons, and he got, just the angels walked in and just released him, and boom, he's out. These people hadn't seen the sun at the end with Paul and the, the boat. for they don't, they don't know where. They think they're all going to perish, but Paul wasn't shaken. Paul said, I know God, and he'll get us out of this, and he did. So whatever we face protection wise we should never fear but in any situation in life we ought to know if God's with us who can be against us it does not matter he's faithful he is our God he is our refuge our fortress if we make him our refuge we need to say lord you are my refuge you're my fortress you're the god that i trust in and anybody that comes against me like what 
say it, that my enemies, they, they, I'll be protected. Doesn't matter what it looks like. And when we make it personal and we have faith in the Lord for our situation, that's when it actually becomes something in our life.